Since her sinking in 1912, Titanic has fascinated millions of people for over a century. The ship itself has entered legendary status over the years, mainly due to the unfortunate nature of her maiden voyage. Over the years, many people have dedicated their time to deciphering just how Titanic behaved during her final hours. An important thing to note here, we will not be discussing the breakup mechanics or actions, as that would need an entire video just to itself. I already have one breakup video on my channel, which you can check out via the card above. The companion document lists several sources of information and portrayals done over the years, and for the sake of time, I've chosen to focus on two of the most well-known portrayals, the 1996 Hackett and Bedford analysis and the 2010 GHS analysis conducted by James Cameron. In 1996, Harlan and Wolf employees Hackett and Bedford began to study the sinking of Titanic using computer technology and simulations for the first time. It marked the first serious attempt of understanding Titanic's flooding since Ever Wilding's testimony at the 1912 inquiries after the disaster. It seemed only fitting that they used Wilding's calculations as a starting point. Slowly, their simulation was pieced together via flooding analysis software at the time, and the result offered us the first modern scientific look into how Titanic sank including such estimates of initial iceberg damage of 12.6 square feet, and how much water began to flood into the ship initially, 25,000 tons per hour. Their findings also showed a crucial element of Titanic sinking, the flooding of Boiler Room 4. Flooding this room too early in the sinking was shown to make the entire ship unstable, eventually leading to a capsizing event. The first condition to look at, 11.50 p.m., or 10 minutes after the collision. Here, water is 8 feet deep in Boiler Room 6, and the starboard bunker for Room 5 is flooding. The mail hold is rapidly filling with water, as are holds 1 and 2, which have begun to equalize. Next, at 12 midnight, the primary thing of note here is that the mail holds and holds 1 and 2 have all pretty much stabilized. Next, at 2.20 a.m., roughly the time that Thomas Andrews delivered the morbid news to Captain Smith, the ship has settled low in the water by now, and the rate of flooding slowly decreases as the ship begins to find an unsteady equilibrium. 12.40 a.m., the first lifeboat, Boat 7, is launched here, approximately one hour after the collision. The forward compartments are now almost entirely full, and the exterior waterline is up to Titanic's name on the bow. At 1.45 a.m., the ship begins to speed up in her descent to the sea floor. The equilibrium starts to give way as the forecastle and sea deck begin to submerge. By 2.10 a.m., all the lifeboats have been launched except for the two collapsibles next to the number one funnel. Boiler Room 4, Titanic's last vestige of buoyancy, begins to rapidly flood. By 2.15 a.m., the Hackett and Bedford analysis showed that Titanic's stern was rising high out of the water, and the analysis ended here, after 35,000 tons of seawater had entered the ship. The Hackett and Bedford paper proved to be a great foundation for future works to build off of, and while the simulation is outdated by today's standards and inaccurate in several areas, there's still valuable information to be found here. With the 100th anniversary fast approaching in 2010, James Cameron commissioned a new flooding, sinking, and structural failure analysis into Titanic. Composed of world-class Titanic historians, all the research and data acquired after 20 years of diving to the wreck, this team used the most cutting-edge technology to once again analyze Titanic's last hours at sea. An interesting thing to note by this paper's author, It's Still Thinking, is, according to his sources, the team ran into a bit of a problem. 
The data yielded two main sinking scenarios. The first concluded that the ship sank in three hours and ten minutes, while the second showed that the ship sank after only two hours and thirty minutes. The team decided to focus their time on the two hour and thirty minute simulation, with further adjustments being made to bring the simulation up to the two hour and forty minute established timeline. According to author It's Still Thinking, the simulations run in the computer were also locked at a zero degree heel, preventing it from list to port or starboard. This was also due to another complication with the computer software, which always caused the model to capsize once the simulation had begun. Within the first 10 minutes of the collision, the ship began to flood very quickly. The four-peak tank filled rapidly, as did the baggage and mail holds. Boiler Room 6 saw slower flooding rates at a depth of only 8 feet. The next major event in the timeline for the GHS simulation occurred at the 50 minute mark, or 12.30 a.m. At this time, the forward holds and Boiler Room 6 have all equalized with water. Water began to flood the number one compartment via E-deck and further aft, it began to work its way along Scotland Road at this time. 1.20 a.m. is the next event, with water slowly filling the forward compartment, and like the Hackett and Bedford simulation, the rate of flooding has slowed significantly after the first hour. Along the aft section of the damaged area, water has reached the E-deck landing of the Grand Staircase, and begun to flood the forward coal bunker for room 4. 1.40 a.m., 20 minutes later. Titanic's bow is now almost completely full of water. Though Boiler Room 4 remains relatively dry, water above it begins to make its way aft of the Grand Staircase. At 1.50 a.m., Titanic's time is running out as the bow is now completely flooded. The forecastle and forward well deck are both submerged and water has risen to the D-deck landing of the Grand Staircase. Boiler Room 4 is finally beginning to fill with water. It is also at this point that several portholes open on the wreck would have become submerged, greatly increasing the amount of water coming into the ship. By 2 a.m., Titanic is close to losing all stability in the water. All of C-deck is now full in the bow and B-Deck is beginning to take on water. The third class dining room and Boiler Room 3 also begin filling at this time, with Boiler Room 4 continuing to fill. Titanic's propellers begin to rise from the water. At 2.05 a.m., the final plunge begins. The Grand Staircase is now full up to B-Deck. Boiler Room 4 is almost completely full, and Room 3 is nearly half full. At 2.07 to 2.08 a.m., the time in which the Maestro analysis program concluded that the ship broke in two at a 23 degree angle. An interesting thing to note here is that the ship is completely full of water forward of the number two funnel. Small amounts of flooding are occurring in areas of the superstructure around the number three funnel uptake. Boiler room three is nearly full, and boiler room two has begun to flood. The simulation at this time theorized that 60,000 tons of water had entered the ship. After tweaking the GHS 2010 simulation to be appropriate length of 2 hours and 40 minutes, I rendered out the Hackett and Bedford analysis in the GHS scenario, but included Samuel Halpern's heel lists applied so that we could get a unique view into how the simulations have changed over time. One final thing to note here is that every second equals one minute of real time, and that for the sake of clarity, the time of day in the simulation has been changed from night to day. If you would like a much more detailed look at the flooding analysis done to Titanic in the past 20 years, with even more simulations and data than can be shown in this video, you should check out the research document by my friend It's Still Thinking in the description down below. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, smooth sailing to you all.